Uh, recently, the Lord has been speaking to me about what is, what is happening to us in this season. And I want to share a verse with you that's one of my life verses. And it's in Isaiah 32, and it's verse 15. And the word of God says, Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be a forest, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Now this verse speaks to me about what begins to happen to us when the Spirit of God is poured upon us from on high. I believe that we have many Pentecosts in our life. Uh, it's almost like I want to write on my bathroom mirror in the morning with lipstick and say, did you have your Pentecost today? Because I feel like every single day we need to have the Spirit of God poured upon us from on high. We are a three-part be being, spirit, soul, and body. And I, it, I think it's very interesting that this is a three-part move of the Spirit in this Bible verse. It says that uh, we're, we go through wildernesses. It talks first about the wilderness. And when you think about a wilderness, we picture an empty, uh, arid expanse, or we picture a, a field with just grass in it and nothing much happening. It may be where they drive the cattle to for their spring feeding and all of that. Uh, but wilderness times are very key in our life. It, is, it was in the wilderness that Jesus was driven after the Spirit was poured upon him from on high when he was baptized by John the Baptist. It is a lonely place or a place of solitude, I think is the better way to say it. And it is a place of trial and testing in these wilderness places. In these wilderness places, we learn to discern what the voices are that are speaking to us. Right now in the world, in, in the United States of America, right now in our own personal lives, there's a lot of voices speaking. Some of them are good. They say good things, but it's not God things. And in a wilderness period, God hones us, and he begins to increase the discerning in our life so we can tell the difference between those voices. Jesus learned the voice of the enemy. And the enemy spoke the word of God to him. But what the enemy did with this good word was he manipulated and twisted that word, trying to get Jesus to move out of God's timing or respond out of his own personal desire or just to disobey God outright. And we've got to discern this. We've got to learn to discern it. We learn to trust in God's word to us in a greater way in the wilderness. His word becomes the foundation for our life. And as we continue to immerse ourselves in that word, it becomes part of us. We become part of the living word in the earth realm. It's here where we learn to submit to God in ways that we've never done before because he may be requiring us in the wilderness to do something that we wouldn't want to do. Chuck prophesied this at the beginning of this pandemic. He said there's going to be things God's going to cause you to do that you would not want to do during this. And I can say that for my own life. There have been things during this time that I've had to step out in faith and do to... Uh, negate all of the other things, all of the other voices that were saying to me, you can't do this, or you shouldn't do this, or if you do this, this will happen. I've had to shut that voice off and go with the foundation of the word of God in my life to, to become a stronger and more faith-filled person. When we submit to God, 
We learn to submit to one another. And I think that that's another aspect of the wilderness. We begin to appreciate the body of Christ in our life like we've never appreciated it before. I don't know about you guys, but being on uh, the webcast and seeing people from around the world, entering, entering into the spirit of worship with them, when the anointing comes on them, it comes right off of that TV screen into my living room. When we're on our own ministry Zooms with people from all over the eastern seaboard and they're getting prophetic words and, and hearing God uh, for all of us, it's amazing. We're learning to submit to where the anointing is falling. It's called kingdom. God's giving us in this wilderness time a new uh, understanding and a new vision for what kingdom really means, what that structure looks like. It's also here where we learn to identify the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. It's noisy out there. And I said that a few minutes ago. There's so many voices. And yet, there is a still, small voice that runs through Scripture, that voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, Elijah ran into the wilderness. He chose to go into the wilderness and the angels had to feed him. He went on a 40-day journey in that wilderness. And when he got to the cave, you know, he was feeling sorry for himself. He was scared. It says that a, that a, a major windstorm came, but God wasn't in it. An earthquake came. God wasn't in it. I think a fire came, and God wasn't in it. And then all of a sudden, a still, small voice spoke. And the scripture says, Elijah wrapped his face in a mantle. I mean, that makes me want to cry because the Spirit of God comes to us in the wilderness, but it's never like we expected it to come. And that's what God's doing with all of us right now. We're hearing him. We're allowing that still, small voice to go so deep into us that it is rooting out the fibers in us that we didn't even know we had. I mean, I've had experiences during this, this pause where God has been dealing with me with issues that happened to me when I was nine years old, fear issues that entered my body and my spirit at nine years old because of something I had read. And God has delivered me from that because of it. The still small voice came and said, let me heal you in this area. So we see these things happening, but in a greater way, I feel what God has been doing in me and in the body of Christ during this time is he is removing from us double-mindedness. You know, the scripture tells us in James 1.8 that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. When we negate God, when we take him out of our life, out of our government, out of our educational system, out of our health system, when we remove God, he removes his wisdom from us. We no longer have the ability to uh, lean on the wisdom of God, the manifold wisdom of God that is supposed to move in every area of our life in earth. Every, ap every aspect of our life, every sphere of influence that we're a part of, we were created to move in the manifold wisdom of God. But yet we find when we look at our nation that we are unstable as a nation. We are unstable as a government right now. We're not what we used to be because we have become double-minded. In many aspects, the church has become double-minded. Uh, some areas of the church don't even believe that the Bible is the word of God. Or we reject the movement of the Holy Spirit in this day and age. I want to say this. We cannot do that. We have got to be a people that are focused and sharp and know the voice of God. And when we hear the voice of God, move in the wisdom of God to implement those truths in our life. James 4.8 says, tells us how to do this. He says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. 
Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Well, we're cleansing our hands now, aren't we? we be, we're being forced to draw nigh to God in this period because we're not allowed to go anyplace else to draw unto anything. And God has said, I am going to create an atmosphere where you will seek me with all of your heart and you will find me. This is what's happening. He's breaking off the double-mindedness. I had a, a uh, dream the other night, and Chuck mentioned it in one of the broadcasts. I dreamed that a golden sword came down from heaven and with a precision cut, cut a house off of its foundation because the house had become useless. It, it was no longer doing what it was supposed to do. I woke up. I mean, it was a quick, short dream. And I woke up troubled in the middle of the night. It was probably about 3 o'clock. And I said, God, is this my house? Is this me? Is this, our, is this our congregation or our ministry? And the Spirit of God spoke to me. And he said, this is the U.S. House of Representatives. And I want to say this and prophesy this today, that God is coming to remove the double-mindedness out of our country, out of us, out of the church. He is coming to remove that which has become useless in his hand. The next day, as I was worshiping, cleaning my house, I, I was in my bedroom just worshiping the Lord. I love to worship when I clean. And I heard the Lord say this to me. It was, a, it was a prophetic word. And he said, and he said, I am putting a clog in the ambiguous voices and plans of man today. Their voices will no longer bring my people into confusion. My children will make a clear choice because they hear my voice and another's they do not hear. I am the good shepherd. Let me say this to you. I had to go look up the word ambiguous. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant. I had a sense of what it may mean. And as I looked it up, this was the definition. Many of you probably know that definition. I was unsure of it. The definition means open to more than one interpretation, having a double meaning. Sounds like double-mindedness to me. It means unclear or inexact because a choice between alternatives has not been made. When Elijah called Israel to Mount Carmel, he said to them, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long, church, will we halt between two opinions? We will either be a company of spirit-led, spirit-empowered sons of God, or we won't. It's our choice. It's been given to us by God. It has been laid out before us. Jesus said, even as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Christ was sent in the exact image of the Father. And he's saying to us in this, in this time of Paul's and now going into Pentecost today with, with, the, with the Spirit of God pouring onto us from on high, today is the day for the manifestation of the sons of God to come forth in God's image, filled with his power, filled with his strength. It's where we are, and I loose that over you today. Lord, I decree today we will see ourselves as God sees us, as Christ sent us in Jesus' name. The scripture also says, I want to just confirm this in the wilderness, in Luke 4.14, and Jesus returned from out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. Now I want to say to us, as we have come out of this wilderness now and entered into our Pentecost season, 
the fame of Christ is going to go out from his body and touch the entire world because we will be filled with his power and filled with his anointing like we've never experienced before. And why do I say to the entire world? Because the entire world has been in a wilderness. And we are all coming out, if we have chosen to do so, with this power and anointing to make him famous. Now, the next, the next portion of this verse in Isaiah 32, 15, I'm going to read it again. Until the spirit be poured upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field. We're coming out of the wilderness and we have become a fruitful field. A fruitful field is a magnificent sight. We live in southern New Jersey. We are known as the Garden State. Fruitful fields are made of rich, dark topsoil. Uh, they have a, it has a smell to it. We would have our fields plowed up every year when my dad had his uh, garden farm behind the house. You could smell it when, when they plowed it up. You could smell it all down the street. There was a rich aroma that came out of that soil. And, and listen, we've just come through 22 cities of a time to plow. God has been plowing us up to create us as a fruitful field for his work. The fruitful field is tended by the husbandmen and the workers. It's not only plowed, but it is fertilized. It is watered. There is, a, there is irrigation set up. It is planted at certain times every year. Some fields have multiple crops and multiple plantings, and the fruit it produces is awesome. We can feed many people with what comes out of a fruitful field. We can create prosperity out of a fruitful field. You know, there's businesses that are created just out of the vegetables and the fruit-bearing trees that happen. We can, we can create scientific uh, expansions with, with fruitful fields. They've learned to create new types of crops and, and, and inter, uh, intercept certain kind of trees, tree branches with others so that they create new fruits that are delicious. It is important that we are a fruitful field because it is out of that fruitful field that we minister to others. We minister out of that fruitful field. Listen to what a fruitful field looks like in Isaiah 35. I'm going to read, read you this short this short chapter, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and bloom as a rose. The fruitful field has a fragrance. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. We shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God in the fruitful field, our life that is a fruitful field. We blossom, we have a fragrance, we are filled with joy and worship. We see the glory of God in our fruitful field, but so do others. Others that have lived their life in a wilderness and never known the way out, when they see us as the fruitful field, they have a desire to be there with us. And it is through the blood and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that in the fruitful field, our weak hands are strengthened and our feeble knees are made ready for battle. Everything we do uh, becomes stronger in the fruitful field. It has more influence. It reaches farther. We have greater stability in battle. Fearful hearts are made strong. God comes with a vengeance and a recompense. As we are functioning in our fruitful field, he avenges us of our enemy. But he also comes with a recompense and pours out upon us everything we seemingly lost in the wilderness. He comes and he causes it to multiply. Think about Job. It says in the end of Job's life, even though he had suffered all those things, he was greater than he was before that. 
The eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. In the fruitful field, not only is there healing and deliverance that breaks forth, but also our spiritual sight and the way we hear God increases in a way that we never imagined could happen. The lame man will leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. We become the river of God to a dry and thirsty land. Our fruitful field becomes just, it becomes like a picture of the kingdom of God for those that are hungry and thirsty and desiring the goodness of God that they have been un unable to find. But here's the thing that God said to me. As good as the fruitful field is, it's magnificent. And I believe that we will always have, just like we always have wilderness seasons in our life, we also need to have fruitful fields in our life continually. There's areas of our life that will always be producing a fruitful field as we move along in our Christian walk. But the Lord said to me one day, because in this scripture, in Isaiah 32, it says the fruitful field becomes a forest. And the Lord said to me, Cheryl, do you know the difference between a fruitful field and a forest? And I said, obviously I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, a fruitful field must always be planted, but a forest reproduces itself. And I began to ponder that. Because what God is doing in us in this season as we've come out of this wilderness and our lives have become a fruitful field, the spirit is being poured upon us from on high. We are becoming strong oak trees. We are becoming that strength and joy-filled forest. Uh, the Lord says we are the, the plant, the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. A strong oak tree stands. I'm looking at one now out the window. Uh, these strong and stately oaks are tall. They are straight. When you look at them, you feel the strength of God in the earth realm. Their roots go deep. Their roots intertwine with the trees next to it. Listen, a forest is a place that cannot be toppled when a strong wind comes. Here in New Jersey, uh, where we have the fruitful fields, most of the farmers plant a tree line next to those fields. So those trees grow up strong and wide. Why? Because when the wind comes, they break that wind. They don't permit the wind to hit the vulnerable plants in the fruitful field that would be toppled over instantly. You must have a forest to build. You can't build with a tomato plant. You can feed with a tomato plant. You can prosper with a tomato plant, but you cannot build with a tomato plant. In order to build the kingdom of God in this season, God is saying, where are my strong oaks? I am pouring out my spirit upon you in this season because you are becoming my strong oaks. You are becoming my trees planted in righteousness. Your roots are going deep and they are intertwining with the roots of others. Your root system will not be moved. When one is sick, that root system will ignite its enzymes and send an enzyme to encapsulate that which would be attacking the root of another tree. Your branches are expanding so that the birds of the air can nest in them. It's a picture of God's kingdom. There are to be strong oaks all over the world. Now we have areas in our life where we are a strong oak. We have areas where we are a fruitful field and there are areas of forests. And it's why, uh, wilderness, it's why we need one another. Because I might be in a wilderness period, but Peter Roselli may be 
be in a time of his life right now where he's a strong oak and I need to go sit in one of those branches until I can come out of my wilderness period and be made strong again. It's what happened, I believe, in this season with Glory of Zion doing these worship and watches. It became a tree that went around the world where we could sit in its branches and hear God speak to us and and we would gain strength from the strength that was coming from that season in, in their life. So, preaching, I'm preaching. <laughs> the interesting thing is this. We've been, hearing, we've, been he- we've been hearing Chuck prophesy a lot about um, the cradle of our nation and the cradle of liberty. You know, we are, we are assigned right now with our whole team here in New Jersey to, to oversee and ignite the 13, original 13 colonies in America. We've been sent out to mobilize the remnant, to awaken those that have been in a wilderness season, to come alive as a fruitful field and be made strong as a, as a forest. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... Um, one of the words for cra- one of the definitions for the word cradle of liberty and just the word cradle don't we think of a sweet little baby bed with those little rockers on the bottom with these fluffy little blankets and we put that newborn baby in that cradle and just touch it and it rocks and it puts that baby to sleep I, that's what i always thought a cradle was but one of the definitions a friend of mine wrote me and said It means a tooth-like instrument put on a scythe to harvest. Ouch, that ain't a cradle with a fluffy little blanket. And so the cradle of liberty, the scythe with the teeth that has been sent to harvest freedom, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is not, There is bondage. There is control. And so God is speaking to us personally that he is harvesting his gifts within us. He is harvesting our future. He's harvesting uh, our assignments and the things that he's called us to do in our life. They're being harvested in this wilderness season right now and in this fruitful field season so that we can implement them in the strength of the forest of the Lord. We're being harvested. And if we do not come into a place where we allow the Spirit of God to come back into our life personally, back into our churches, back into our nation, we will never have the liberty that God meant for this nation to walk in. He is harvesting right now. We are in a cradle, a cradle of liberty. We are harvesting liberty because it's what we were made to be. And if we don't harvest it, if we don't allow that sith with the teeth on it to come into our lives and cut out the bad and release the new, We won't walk in what God has called us to walk in. When those disciples were in the upper room and that sound came as a rushing, mighty wind, I want to tell you something. They were released in the power of God. Their fruitful place became a forest. Their wilderness became a fruitful place. Streams ran out into the desert and it affected the entire world. And God's doing that right now. He's getting ready today to release us with the power of his majesty, with the identity of his sonship, to to cause these streams to go out and water a world that has been dry and arid for way too long. So I just encourage you today, be ready and willing for that spirit to come in you and blow you right out 
of your wilderness, blow you right out of your fruitful field, and blow you into that fruitful, awesome forest that you're made to be so that God can build his kingdom in this earth like he has prophesied he was going to do. I loose the harvest of souls. I loose it, and I say out of the harvest of our gifts, God, out of the harvest of our assignments, out of the harvest of your spirit in our lives, we release that harvest of souls to come across the world beginning today in Jesus' mighty name. I bless you, and I decree over you today, you are the manifestation of the sons of God. Go in the power of his might. Go in the image of the Father. Fear not. Move as I call you to move, says the Lord. See yourself as I see you. See others as I see them. Call forth what is not. Call it forth as though it is. And I say to you, the influx of souls will be something you have only dreamed about. The tsunami of salvations comes, says the Lord. And it comes because my spirit has been loosed through you in this day. Amen. Well, I, I, I can feel it, I'll tell you that. But yeah. Chuck, you commissioned us to go find righteous and unrighteous roots. And I just wanted to share with you something that we've really discovered in reading and in this reset. In Isaiah 54, 2, it talks about uh, expansion. It talks about tents being bigger, cords being stronger. And that all speaks of uh, evangelism. And I've been studying that over and over again. I've, my audio Bible has gone almost all through the New Testament, but I'm always spending time in Isaiah. And I was Googling Isaiah 54 too, and I came across a man I really didn't know that much about. His name was William Carey. He was called the father of missions in the 1700s. He was reading a book by Jonathan Edwards, who's buried in Princeton, New Jersey, about a man called David Brainerd, who was a circuit rider all through the, the Northeast, but his brother founded a church right down the street from our house. That's all part of the landscape of New Jersey. And he was also reading a book by a man named James Cook, who you may not know, but if I say what he did, Captain Cook, you'll know that name. He discovered Hawaii. He was the first English ship to go to Australia and New Zealand, an explorer. And so this man, William Carey, as a young man, grew up in the Church of England, and in, as a teenager, he went, wound up in a Baptist church, but he started working at 17 repairing shoes. He worked for a man who owned a shoe repair business, so he was dealing with souls. I love how God has a sense of humor. He worked for that man for several years, and the man died and, and left him the business. So now he's a full-blown shoe repair salesman. He taught himself Hebrew and Greek by the time he was 18. But he starts reading now about David Brainerd from Jonathan Edwards, a revivalist here, the Great Awakening. He starts reading about Captain Cook traveling far to unknown places. And he winds up going to India, being a missionary to India for 41 years, translating the Bible into six different dialects in India. And what the Lord showed me during this reset there was a stirring in that man's spirit because of the message that came from New Jersey. And today, I release that stirring to everyone who hears this broadcast. There's a stirring in your spirit to go into the unknown, to reach out to people groups like David Brainerd did, and reach people that have never been reached before. And some of them may live on your street. In the name of Jesus Christ, now is the time. Let it stir and come to, let it be a fruitful field in your life this day in Jesus' name. God bless you.